The Passion of Jesus I Was Thinking of You Written by Miss Lorianne Matisse Read for you by Chiquito Jochen Crasto Scene 15 Setting Pilate's Place of Judgment Gabatha Matthew chapter 27 verses 19 to 28 now Pilate and his cohorts brought me to the place of judgment known as Gabbatha. It was the sixth hour of the day of preparation. This would be the final setting before the decision to condemn me to death. Herod and Pilate became friends today. Isn't it sad how enemies become friends when united against God? Perhaps it is their weaknesses that cause men and women to gather in groups when criticizing me. Perhaps insecurities drive them together. A person is less apt to speak against God on a lonely desert plain in the middle of the night. The stars alone shine so brightly they swallow up cynicism with heavenly praises. One can find strength when one is alone in nature. A symphony the universe outshines the stuttering and stammering of sarcasm and groupthink. I had walked alone when I was tested in the desert. I had to walk alone this day, as the crowd shouted for the release of Barabbas. The crowd somehow felt superior when faced with a murderer or criminal. Perhaps it is easier to hide behind the weak than to face the Messiah, Jesus, who calls himself God. When one is face to face with God, for I am the face of God, and doubts of one's own conscience are called into account in the omnipotent presence of God, public opinion is drowned out simply by the fact that I am He. Perhaps in your guilt you do not know what to say, and the words of your own justification are caught in your throat. It is then you need a Saviour who takes your iniquity completely and absolutely without uttering a word of deceit. In fact, no deceit was found in my mouth. This is why I remain silent today, for I was thinking of you. The day when the accuser of the brethren incriminates you, brings up your guilt, your misdeeds, your wrongdoings, and beats you over the head with your sin, it is then you need a saviour who knew who he was and who he is, a saviour who needs no defence. When you have no defence, I am your defence. When the accusers of your soul are shouting, Crucify him, crucify her, he deserves to die, she deserves to suffer for what she did, I am your defence. I die in your place. Your sins are remembered no more. I put them as far as the east is from the west. Perhaps you are innocent, but your accusers do not believe you. It is then you need a saviour who was falsely accused. I have gone before you, paved a path for you in humility and meekness all the way to heaven. The roar of the crowd around me continued. Crucify him! Crucify him! When Pilate was about to completely buckle under the crowd's pressure, he remembered his wife's dream. He remembered her pale, torn face looking up at him with her sweet, trusting eyes when she whispered in her eerie tone, I have nothing to do with this man. I suffered much in a dream last night because of him. Pilate loved his wife. He respected her. But what is a dream? What is truth? Could a warning in a dream be counted on? Can a dream prove to be a valid reason to ignore a screaming, frenzied mass? Of course it can. But people over the centuries to come will often not give a second thought to a woman's dream, or anyone's dream for that matter, even though many dreams are given to people for warnings. If Pilate told the crowd he could not crucify me because of his wife's dream, 
they might pick up stones and throw them at him instead. A frightening thought, but perhaps this could have saved his soul. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew chapter 10 verse 28 Pilate could not forget the image of his wife as she gripped her stomach nervously while she spoke, as if the knots in her stomach would become knots around his throat. Sweat poured down his brow. The crowd is shouting much too loud, he screamed inside of his head. Won't someone stop the shouting? I must get a hold of myself. I have a reputation to uphold, he frantically debated with himself. I will have it work out with my wife later. One more chance, one more chance, Pilate decided, as he unclenched his hands around his own throat. I will give the crowd one more chance to relent. Pilate faced the maddening crowd, much like facing a ravenous beast in a jungle, and emphasized for the third time. I find no fault in this man. Release unto us Barabbas! Release unto us Barabbas! What shall I do with this man Jesus? Pilate retorted. Crucify him! Crucify him! What has he done? Pilate implored the mob at the top of his lungs now, but the deafening roar of the crowd drowned out his voice. Crucify him! Crucify him! As I silently listened to their protests, I thought about each one of them. I knew each person intimately. I knew the number of hairs on each of their heads. I had woven each of them together in their mother's womb. In the darkness, I had formed each body, each brain, every organ, giving each of them their specific DNA. My thoughts toward each of them were more than the grains of sand of the sea. I knew when they arose in the morning. I knew when they sat down. I knew each word on their tongue, just as I know your words, your thoughts, just as I know your going out and coming in. I was thinking of them, just as I am thinking of you now. Destiny was in my hands. I was not afraid. Pilate, however, was quite terrified when he clearly could see that even after all of his pleading he had failed. Surely his reasoning was sound, but how can one reason with the unreasonable? Utterly defeated, a dark cloud came over him. He felt like a nervous rabbit, caught in a trap, surrounded by hungry coyotes. He stared, but not at me, more like through me, hoping there was a way out. He wondered how I had gotten myself into this predicament. He shook his head with pity. I did not pity myself. I did, however, pity him. He was caught in the middle of my people Israel, whom I came to save, the sons and daughter who descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I was their long-awaited Messiah. I had come to them, but they did not receive me. They did not recognize me, their much longed for king, deliverer, Masiach, who was the one appointed by Yahweh, who descended from the Davidic line to rule the united tribes of Israel. I stood before them now, just as I had stood before them in the temple on the feast of Sukkot. On the last day of the seven day feast, I proclaimed publicly, If anyone is thirsty, let him or her come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 38. I knew full well the significance of what I was saying. The Jewish leaders of the temple knew what I meant as well, but they only added it to their list of blasphemous statements which they accused me of making. During Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, my people Israel carried torches around the temple 
illuminating bright candelabrum along the walls of the temple to demonstrate the coming Messiah, who would be a light to the Gentiles as well. The priest would draw water from the pool of Siloam and carry it to the temple, where it was poured into a silver basin beside the altar. The priest would call upon Yahweh to provide heavenly water in the form of rain. Many people looked forward to the future, to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the latter harvest, as was spoken by the prophet Joel. When I proclaimed that I was the living water, I was proclaiming to be the source of the water, the Maim Haim, living water coming straight from heaven. When I then exclaimed, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 8 verse 12 The people in the temple understood that I was claiming to be the Messiah, the light to both Jews and Gentiles. Sadly, they were too blind to see the light who stood before them. No, I did not pity myself. I knew what I must do. I did pity Pilate, however, for even though he would make this decision with a sorrowful heart, not one of anger, malice, or greed, he will still be swayed by public opinion, which will be his ultimate downfall. I also had pity for my people Israel, for oh, how they would suffer after this night. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's anointed ones, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks, how often I would have gathered them under my wings. Luke chapter 13, verse 34. I knew a time was coming soon, after they rejected their Messiah, that Jerusalem would be under siege and taken from them for nearly two thousand years. For this long period of time, they will be scattered throughout the earth. When Israel becomes a nation again, and they inhabit Jerusalem, the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. Luke chapter 21 verse 24 The Gentile church age will rise up and be a predominant presence on the earth until 1967. After a six-day war, when the Jews capture Jerusalem once again, I will pour out my Spirit on Jew and Gentile, and they will become one new man. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16 For I am indeed the light to the world, both Jew and Gentile. As the mounting doom gathered against me, I remembered the previous week when I rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, exalted as a king. The shouts coming from the crowds at this procession were shouts of joy, gladness, praise and exaltation. Many people who were now shrieking, Crucify him! were then shouting with glee, Long live the king! God has given us a king! Let heaven rejoice! Glory to God in the highest! Hallelujah! The euphoria of the adoring crowd did not affect me that day, neither does the clamour of this belligerent crowd affect me now. I am not swayed by public opinion. I do only what I see the Father doing. I live only to please my Father in heaven. I am without blemish, perfect in every way. I cast no stones against the crowds. Whether the public is for me or against me is of no consequence to me. The consequence remains solely with each person's decision in his or her own heart. I remain the same, yesterday, today, and forever. I was thinking of them, as I was thinking of you, just as I am thinking of you now. When the waves of the masses ebb and flow, and you are drifting alone on your own raft, troubled, being tossed to and fro on the waves of indecision, you can call upon me. I will calm the storm. I will walk on the water and reach out my hand to you and say, Take courage. I am. 
don't be afraid. Matthew chapter 14 verse 27 You will notice there are wounds on my wrists, and the wounds will make you whole. I was thinking of you, as the crowds were shouting both with glee or with anger. I could hear your cry amidst the crowd, and I set my face like a flint to accomplish the task of your salvation. I could also hear your shouts, some of when you are praising me for what I have done, and other times when you are cursing me for what I have not done. That you think would have been better for you. I know. This will be a constant struggle for many, but my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and returns not, but waters the earth, and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so that my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 to 11 There will be things that happen in your life you do not understand. My beloved, just as no one understands my journey today, no one understood the meaning of my joyous procession to the Mount of Olives. The crowds on that glorious day, who spread their robes along the road ahead of me, expected a king who would rule the earth, instead of a king who would be crucified to make a way into heaven, for his kingdom is not of this earth. During the procession, the Pharisees had murmured among the crowd. They commanded me, Sir, Rebuke your followers for saying things like that. But I replied, Even if the crowd keeps quiet, the rocks and stones along the road will burst into hosannas. Luke chapter 19 verse 40 I could not share in the joy that day, which many of you now celebrate as Palm Sunday, for I knew what would happen to Jerusalem and the temple after my death. I knew what would happen to my people for thousands of years as they were driven from Jerusalem. As we came closer to Jerusalem, I began to cry in my spirit. Eternal peace was within your reach, and you turned it down. It is now too late. The enemies will pile up earth against your walls, encircle you, close in on you, crush you to the ground. Your children will suffer with you. There will not be one stone left upon another in the temple, as you have rejected the new temple standing before you. Luke chapter 19, verses 42 to 44. Even though most of my people will forsake me, all of my first disciples and followers are Jewish and they will become the foundation of my church. The leaders of my temple, who were hard of heart, would not share in this foundation. Often this is how it is with organized religion. Many followers are pure in heart, whereas power and leadership often turns good people into evil ones. This is why I had to curse the fig tree the next day after the procession. The fig tree represents the hearts of my people, Israel, who were in charge of the temple in Jerusalem. My temple was to be a place of prayer, but they had made it a den of thieves. It had to crumble because they had rejected the plan of Yahweh. Pity, isn't it, when one cannot recognize God because of a hard heart? Pilate shook his head now, not at me but at the crowd. As the weight of the masses pressed him down, he sorrowfully made his final decision. He then took water and symbolically washed his hands while the crowd stared at him. He said, 
I am innocent of the blood of this just man, even though he stated it with resolve, as if he could absolve his own guilt. Even though he washed his hands, he remained guilty, as he gave me over to their wishes. See to it. You might have thought the crowd would feel a hint of shame or a hush of remorse. Perhaps one or two might have felt the chilly reverberation of the unjust sentence that had just been uttered. But no. The noise only escalated, and their commitment to see me crucified more obstinate. They now, in great ignorance, pleaded loudly, Let his blood be on us and on our children. I cast my head to the ground. I remembered the night before when I sweat drops of blood as I whispered, Not my will, but yours be done. My father knew the course this day would take. It was prophesied many years ago by the prophets. The Jewish leaders knew of these prophecies. They just did not accept the way in which they were fulfilled. Years later, when they inhabit Jerusalem again, most of them will still be looking for another Mashiach, instead of me, Jesus, Yeshua, their righteous Messiah. To their surprise, I will come in the clouds to stand on the Mount of Olives as the risen and reigning King of the universe. They will weep as one who has lost an only son when they gaze upon me, he whom they pierced. The verdict of death is progressing so quickly now. I guess this is how it is with bad decisions. Move them along quickly, without prolonging the tragedy. If one takes too much time to think, one might actually change one's mind. Ludicrous decisions are like a mudslide. Usually, it is not one decision that causes the disaster, but many small decisions put together finally becoming a sum of wrong choices and unstable foundation. Many small stones of truth taken out of the cliffside, a stone tossed aside here, another there, until there is nothing left but slippery sand, silt, mud. All it takes to topple is a little rain. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine, and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And every one that hears these sayings of mine, and does them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. This was how it was with Judas. At each crossroads, he could have softened his heart and followed in the correct path I must take. Just as Pharaoh could have softened his heart and saved his firstborn son by setting the children of Israel free in Egypt. Each one might have delivered himself from his own very hour of darkness. My hour of darkness was fast approaching. It was upon me now. The darkness of human hearts would rather crucify their Messiah than worship him. Sinful hearts, who would rather set a murderer free than release the blameless one, completely free from sin. The thick, heavy veil of the temple which separates the Holy of Holies from the people, I will tear in half in the hour of my death. The ripping of this veil will open a door, so that anyone who calls on my name can enter into intimate fellowship with Yahweh. Yet this same veil will be a symbol of the veil which will remain over the eyes of my people Israel for nearly two thousand years. As the shouts began, Let his blood be on our hands and upon our children's hands. I looked down at my hands. 
the hands that hold the universe in a span. My hands will be covered in blood in a few hours, as I am ruthlessly nailed to an execution stake by their hands. And yet, the irony of guilt upon one's hands will be absorbed by the wounds in my hands. The blood which will pour from my hands will be available to them for redemption, freedom from guilt. I shuddered with a shudder that rocked the universe as the shouts continued. A tidal wave of blood, of doom and of death, ripped the atmosphere of time and space, of order and of goodness. I saw past, present and future. I knew their children, their children's children, their generations for time and times and time to come. I thought of how they would be scattered over the earth for almost two thousand years. A chill now pierced my spine, a chill than that of Herod's indifferent chill, than that of Herod's impending doom. This chill was for the persecution my people would suffer. I could have stopped the audacious scene. I could have torn the troposphere with a bolt of lightning. I could have split the ground in two. I could have disappeared. Poof! But no. I persisted to remain upright in my mangled, messy, blood-stained robe. For I was thinking of you. The matter would be blood now. Sin requires a blood sacrifice. Blood must be shed because of arrogance. Blood must be shed because of ignorance. I persevered to go through with this death in order to shed my blood, to cover you, for I was thinking of you, as I am thinking of you now. When you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, when you have caused a little one to stumble and the blood is still on your hands, you can wash your hands and your heart in my blood. Pilate frantically washed his hands, but he did not feel clean. From this day on, he would now have nightmares, waking up with blood-stained hands, unable to scour them spotless again. Oh, if he would have listened to the warning in his wife's dream! But how often do people listen? How often do they act? The blood on the hands of the crowd, the blood they asked for, will create an outpouring of bloodshed for generations to come. Somehow, the washing of their hands never seemed to cleanse the stain, not after today. Even to this day, my religious people of Israel wash their hands. They wash, they wash, but remain unclean. Only the blood of Jesus, the righteous Messiah, can wash away sin. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 There will be judgment on the world. It must be so. How could someone serve an unrighteous God? If Yahweh lets people get away with evil doings, what kind of trust can you put in Him? But just as God is judge, He is also Jesus. As my Father judges, I, His Son, have stretched out my hands and will allow them to be pierced, so that the blood will be on my hands instead. I willingly take the judgment upon myself for them and for you. And the blood will keep pouring to their children, to their children's children, and to you throughout every generation until I return as king. For I was thinking of their children just as I was thinking of you as I am thinking of you now. When your hands are soiled with sin and never feel quite clean, put your hands in mine. I will wash them as white as snow. I, the living Torah, was thinking of you as I am thinking of you now. 
Eve's Memoirs and Other Books and Art by Laurie Matisse, available at www.evesmemoirs.com www.lauriematisse.com www.mysticcenter.com Laurie's blog, Weaving Light lauriematisseblog.wordpress.com For information on Eve the Musical, contact lauriematisse at gmail.com End Times Info www.mysticcenter.com www.calculatingthelast7.com Support the work of translating this book into other languages https colon two forward slashes www.patreon.com forward slash Laurie Matisse